Okay, uh, so first thing, um, everybody is supposed to come and see me this week, right? Only one of you has so far done so, so just remember that I am in uh, the office tomorrow. Um, functionally speaking, between, like technically my office hours are between 10 and 12, but functionally speaking I'm there between 10 and 2 now. So you know, if you come anytime, I have another appointment at 11, but otherwise if you come anytime between 10 and 2, um, that's, that's cool. Are you here on Friday? Or is um, it I'm typically not here on Friday, but I can be if you need me to be. Okay. Um, although this this Friday is a little this Friday is a little dodgy. I could probably be here afternoon. Um, I have to uh, I have to take my dog in for a shot. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's 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 just an allergy shot. It's, she's fine. It's just, but she she's not going to be happy. With <laughs> it's always so sad taking mm -hmm. dogs to the vet. Yeah. So uh, while we're here, does anybody have any questions about upcoming assignments that I can answer for you? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right then. Um, so, um, today we're going to be talking about Ireland. Um, so, what do you all know, if anything, about Ireland? They're the ones with, like, St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> uh, well, you know, it's, it's funny, like, yeah, we associate St. Patrick's Day with Ireland, right? But um, at least the way it's celebrated here, St. Patrick's Day is really probably a bigger Irish-American thing than it is an Irish thing. Um, when it's celebrated now in Ireland, it's a little bit more like Mardi Gras. Um, like the university, the, the university art students make big floats in Dublin, and you know, they, they're, 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 there's a parade down the street, but it's, it's not, um, like you see fewer like markers of a specifically like Irish cultural identity in actual Irish St. Patrick's Day. So, okay, so we know about St. Patrick's Day. We are aware that Ireland is a vaguely potato-shaped island um, <laughs> about the size of New Jersey in the North Atlantic, right? Yeah. I mean, oh, go I'm ahead. Kind of related, but related. Um, where I'm from is Dublin, Georgia, and the people okay. that founded the town are from Ireland. The uh -huh. guy, he named it, and he's like, he set up Dublin, Georgia, mm -hmm. in for his wife, who was from Ireland, who was originally Irish, mm -hmm. so that she would feel at home in Dublin. Okay. That's yeah. Kind of Ireland. All right. And yeah, that's interesting too, because that like Georgia isn't a state that has a big history of Irish immigration. Right? Right. When we think of like Irish immigration, we're looking kind of more at like the Northeast and the Upper Midwest, right? That's where we see a lot of um, the Irish ending up uh, when they come to the U.S. But one of the things we're going to talk about today is some of the forces that were actually moving the Irish across the Atlantic Ocean, um, as well as you know the relationship between Ireland and Great Britain, the larger island to its east. Um, and why would we why would we why would we be talking about Ireland and Irish literature in a British literature course to begin with? I'll give you the short answer to that. Um, Every now and again, like you know, when I, I post like one of these you know, one of these course videos online, like I get you know somebody who talks about my profound ignorance um, in placing an Irish lit class or uh, Irish literature content in a British lit class. Um, most of those people are nationalists, like hardcore Irish nationalists, um, who <clears throat> are reasonably peeved about you know, a long history of colonial oppression, right? But, practically speaking, we do offer an Irish Lit class, but it's upper division, and I only get to teach it about every five years. So, if y'all are gonna get any Irish literature at all, this is the only place I really can put it. <laughs> Not to mention that Irish writers, particularly of the early 20th century, uh, you know, writers like um, W.B. Yeats and James Joyce have a profound influence on English language literature more broadly 
particularly on writers in Britain. Um, and a lot of it has to do with that vexed colonial relationship. Okay, so let's kind of figure out here where we can place that relationship uh, historically. Um, it goes back a really long way. In fact, there was no unified political entity called Ireland prior to about the 18th century. Um, you had four, sometimes five kingdoms in various parts of the island, divided up more or less thusly. Right, you had Ulster in the north, Leinster in the east, Munster in the south, and Connaught in the west, with sometimes uh, a fifth kingdom called Meath kind of in the middle. But Meath didn't always exist. It's not always clear, like, kind of where Meath begins and Leinster ends historically, right? So, um, <clears throat> Even like from the Middle Ages, um, Ireland was frequently politically dominated by England, right? Um, in the 12th century, um, a group of English knights, specifically Norman knights, um, come over from England and um, stake out territorial claims in Ireland. In fact, um, any Irish last name that starts with the prefix Fitz, like, you know, Fitzgerald, Fitzsimmons, Fitzpatrick, whatever, right? That's actually a Norman name. So that indicates Norman French ancestry. And so these people set themselves up as the island nobility. And while they're culturally connected to the Norman court in England, they operate in Ireland more or less autonomously. And they kind of become accustomed to um, having their own way um, in Ireland. Now, by the 16th century, the great religious schism between Catholics and Protestants has occurred, right? You know, basically Protestantism, Protestantism has become a thing, right? Whereas, you know, about a century prior, it was not, right? It didn't exist. Uh, but England goes in, and Scotland go in the Protestant direction. Ireland remains predominantly Catholic. Um, so after a couple of uh, failed rebellions in Ireland by native Irish lords, um, <clears throat> the British government starts moving these Irish, sending these Irish noblemen who have been rebellious into exile and replanting settlers in their former lands, particularly in Ulster in the north, right? So you have um, the former native Irish population um, largely replaced with Scottish uh, Presbyterians in what's called the Ulster Plantation. They also tried to plant a bunch of Protestants in Munster, but that didn't really take. So over time, what comes to happen uh, is a kind of class division that is built along ethnic and religious lines within Ireland. And you have the emergence by the 18th century of a group called the Anglo-Irish. So Anglo-Irish, it should be fairly easy to figure out what that means, right? So what, 
what would you think an Anglo-Irish person is? Like, what would you think that indicates about them? If someone is Anglo-Irish, about their ethnicity. Anglo-Saxon and Irish. So from England. And, well, of England and Irish. Exactly. Yeah, more or less. Yeah. So an Anglo-Irish person is an Irish person of English descent, right? Yes. So the Anglo-Irish largely make up the landowning class. And for various reasons, the professional class, especially in and around Dublin, which is kind of right here-ish. And also in the largest city in the north, Belfast. Which is otherwise largely working class and uh, you know, filled with uh, Protestants of largely Scottish descent. So, by the end of the 18th century, these Anglo-Irish, who are Protestant, along with several educated Catholic Irish, become very much influenced by Enlightenment philosophical ideals, right? The same kinds of ideals that motivated the American and French revolutions. And so in 1798, a group called the United Irishmen stage what is still in Ireland referred to as a rising rather than a revolution, right? Because if we think back to the original meaning of the word revolution, right, a return to a point of origin, rising, that is the people rising up against an oppressive government, right, is probably actually a more accurate descriptor of what's happening. Uh, but so yeah, so the, the United Irishmen stage a rising across Ireland. Um, and again, like, I think it's worth stressing that what unites these guys is their philosophical ideals, right? You know, they're reading um, Rousseau, they're reading Voltaire, they're reading these French philosophers who are talking about um, putting power back into the hands of the people, right? You know, and um, out of the hands of, you know, say, you know, a monarch or the clergy. Um, <clears throat> and this rising is pretty brutally put down. And most of the leaders are arrested and or executed. Some of them uh, go on hunger strike in prison and um, end up starving to death. But one of the reasons why this particular rising is important is it's one of the last major uh, points of Protestant Catholic cross-community cooperation in Irish history until the 20th century, right? And after this rising, in fact, in 1800, the Westminster Parliament in England and the Irish Parliament in Dublin agree on an act of union. So essentially in 1800, the Irish Parliament votes itself out of existence. And from this point onward, um, up until the 1920s, when um, Ireland achieves its own independence again, Ireland sends uh, deputies to Westminster. They send deputies to the Westminster Parliament rather than having their own government, right? So at this, from this point, Ireland is fully incorporated into the United Kingdom. As opposed to just being a kind of separate entity that happens to be ruled by the same monarch. Okay, everybody with me so far? Any questions? 
Yes, the left kingdom. Uh huh. Poster. What is that? Is that Connecticut? No, no. Connacht. C O N N A C H T. Apologies for my terrible handwriting. Um, in part due to religious chauvinism, um, in part due to comparative poverty, um, is always a real kind of junior partner in the United Kingdom. Um, and this becomes clear to the Irish people in the 1840s. Now what do we remember from our discussion of Charles Dickens about the 1840s? Does anybody remember what happened? The hungry 40s with the potato crops that kept failing for several yes. years in the famines. For several years in Ireland, yeah, this is the broader period is referred to as the hungry 40s, right? But specifically in Ireland, yeah, the potato crop failed for several years. Um, so the Irish refer to this period as, um, in the Irish language, on Gortamor. Or the great hunger. And um, there's a lot of seething anger against the British government in Ireland during and after this period because they feel that Parliament could have done more to help than it did. The Parliament in the 1840s was very much devoted to free market ideology, right? And kind of like trusted the invisible hand of the market to simply correct things and just step in and fix it all, right? So well, we're in a period of depression right now, but you know, woman bus cycles, that's capitalism, right? Meanwhile, um, you know, Irish people are starving to death. So the death toll from the great hunger is actually not as high as the emigration toll. The big effect of this on the Irish population is to shrink the population substantially. In particular, the poorest classes of the, uh, of the Irish, basically um, people who were like very like subsistence farmers. Um, emigr you know, if they don't die, then they emigrate in large numbers uh, to England, that was the biggest destination, to the United States or to Australia. So there's a great loss of population. And it won't be until the 1990s that Ireland again like becomes a net um, a net importer of people rather than an exporter of people. And as discontent with British rule grows, and as these Irish diaspora communities form outside of Ireland, we also witness a growth in nationalism. So I know that um, some of you are taking or have taken government, right? Do any of you know what the difference is between a nation and a state? We might have talked about this before, but I'm not quite sure. All right, I will take your silence to me now. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so a state refers to a political body, right? A set of political institutions um, that is administered by a government, right? With set borders and presumably diplomatic relationships with other states um, and everything that goes with that, right? So when we talk about the state, we're basically talking about the apparatus of government. A nation instead refers to a group of people 
with a shared cultural identity. Now, prior to the 19th century, um, which was, as we, as we know, like in, you know, an age of empires, most people's sense of belonging didn't really extend much beyond the boundaries of their village if they lived in the country, or their neighborhood if they lived in a city. You know, that was kind of what, like the, the amount of world that most people could reasonably consider themselves a part of. And you know, if you live in a city, you're like, what is a neighborhood but a village that just happens to be surrounded by a bunch of other villages, right? <laughs> but <clears throat> particularly in colonized countries that often, you know, kind of like feel like they have been robbed of their particular cultural identity. Um, by the imperial power. This notion of a broader connection starts to become a force, right? Um, in fact, like if you look at the first book I've placed on your bibliography there is a book by a, a guy by the name, a scholar by the name of Benedict, Dan, Benedict Anderson. And Anderson refers to a nation as essentially an imagined community. Right, so you start to come to an understanding, or a belief anyway, that you, know, you share a language, a history, and a set of cultural uh, habits or institutions with a broader group of people right, than just those who live in your village. And so, in the 18th and 19th centuries, we start seeing the development of what's called a nation state, right? Where who belongs as a citizen of the state is at least in part determined by whether they are also part of the nation, right? Part of this broader shared cultural heritage or ethnic heritage, right? And a lot of this is a kind of resistance to having one's own cultural identity defined by outsiders. So I'd like now to turn for a minute to the, um, the Matthew Arnold piece on the, uh, on the study of Celtic literatures. And I'd just kind of like to know what you thought of this. Starts on page uh, 693. I thought it was really interesting to see like the idea of like that sensibility come back up, just because we have talked a lot about it in that thing, yeah. and also like how it was connected with that entire nation, but it was seen as like the greatest strength and the greatest weakness of that uh -huh. people group, like at the exact same time, and. That was just kind of interesting to me. Yeah, and what's, yeah, what's Arnold doing with this familiar idea of sensibility here? How is he connecting it to this particular national identity, right? what, what he calls the Celts, right? If we look at the way Arnold, just Matthew Arnold describes the Celts, what features does he ascribe to this group of people? Okay, yeah. They have yeah, enthusiasm for learning. But what are they unable to do with that learning, according to Arnold? think that the Celt is typical of bending that learning to any practical end. Yeah, he regards them as impractical and ineffectual, right? I 
know what I was reading this. It just seemed a bit like he was infantilizing them a little bit. Okay, yeah, explain. Um, by the way, he kept describing them. It's almost as if, as if he was, um, especially like mentioning you know, like chivalry and romance and things like that, uh -huh. as if he was treating it um, the way 17 and 18, 19. 18 and 19th century men treated women like dainty. They're so dainty and be gentle with them. Yeah. They know fact, things, but they don't know how powerful they can be. Yeah, in fact, he refers to the Celt as feminine, right? right? Yeah. And when you're talking about chivalry and that sort of thing, right, does he seem to think that the Celt's um, sensibility kind of belongs to the present and future or to the past? Does he seem to associate these people more with the present or with the past? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he seems to that these are people whose day is basically over, right? That time has passed them by. I used to think he was doing that, especially since he brought up sensibility. I thought it was like uh -huh. trying to tie them back to like a dated um, idea yeah. of them being like obviously the romantic period and the sensibility, like time. Yeah, back to back. Sens sensibility is a late 18th century idea, right? right? So yeah, by, by the time Arnold is writing, it's yeah, it's a little outdated, mm -hmm. sure. But tying them even you know to things like chivalry and romance, right? Like specifically referring to kind of medieval concepts. What else does he say about Celts here? And does this discourse look at all familiar to you? Does it look like anything else that we? Yeah, it does look a little bit like Orientalism, right? You're kind of projecting these sets of characteristics, many of them negative, onto another group of people, right? So we see that this was a practice that's kind of more broadly applied when we're dealing with colonized nations, right? That it's not just the so-called, you know, Oriental nations at the time, right, that the British are applying these ideas to. That they're also applying it to their own neighbors to the West. I mean, I also think kind of like the white man bird thing, that it's our duty to help them. They, you know, they mm -hmm. are able to help themselves. So let's yes, help them. the, the, the practical Saxon <laughs> needs to drag these poor, benighted, imaginative folks, right, right, out of their caves and out of the mud, right, <laughs> into the present, yeah. No, yeah, there, there, there is, I think, yeah, that kind of tone. I think you are, you are not wrong to detect that here. And the reason I wanted you to read this Matthew Arnold piece is because this is what Irish writers are trying to define themselves against at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th. Right, so W.B. Yeats is part of a kind of broader wave of what are called cultural nationalist projects. Okay, so if nationalism is a kind of political attachment um, to a specific cultural identity, right? Then what might cultural nationalism be? So a national, political nationalist, right? is going to try to advance the prospects of his, his or her nation through political action of some sort, right? Whether, you know, through, you know, representation in parliaments or, you know, some other kind of activism, legal or illegal, right? What, do you, what is a cultural nationalism? Someone who's trying to advance their 
better way of teaching, learning, mm -hmm. um, style of living. Um, I guess more of the social part, so like etiquette, manners, mm -hmm. think that way. Um, mm -hmm. Arts. Architecture, arts. Art, architecture, yeah, essentially, yeah, like it's an attempt, yeah, to set the parameters of cultural expression um, within a given group, right, to show that this nation is in fact a separate culture, right, with its own norms um, and its own codes. So, for example, like among the cultural nationalist organizations that sprung up in the 1880s and 1890s, we have, you know, the earliest, I think, is the Gaelic, the Gaelic Athletic Association, which is founded in 1884. So the GAA encouraged Irish people to stop playing field hockey, soccer, and rugby, and instead to play uh, a traditional Irish sport called hurling, which is kind of like a cross between field hockey and lacrosse. Right, essentially, like you know, you've got these sticks and a ball, and you're trying to get the ball into a net, uh, but the uh, the sticks have a kind of groove at the end that you catch the ball in. Right, so it's not a net like lacrosse, but you know, the the action is kind of similar. What's the name of the sport? The sport is called hurling. hurling. And then, as a substitute for rugby, they basically invent a sport called Gaelic football that is pretty similar to rugby in most respects, but with, slight, with, with some slight revisions to the rules, right? But yeah, essentially what they're trying to show is that, you know, that this particular form of cultural expression, right, sport, is different in Ireland, right? That they have their own sport traditions. Um, in 1893, Folklorist um, and linguist by the name of Douglas Hyde uh, helps to found a group called the Gaelic League. And what the Gaelic League does is promote instruction in the Irish language. Now, by the 1890s, there weren't that many speakers of Irish left. In fact, the, uh, the Great Hunger in the 1840s had done away with the vast majority of Irish speakers, either through um, you know, death or immigration, right? because Irish speakers tended to be the poorest segment of the population, and thus the most vulnerable to starvation. So what Hyde instead did was teach Irish to the rising Catholic middle class particularly in cities like Dublin and Cork. Where they develop, you know, would develop then a stronger sense of connection to Irish language traditions. So on the one hand, like this prevented the language from being forgotten and dying out, right? But it was also a kind of, um, attempt to stop English from becoming the national language of Ireland, which wasn't entirely successful. If you go to Ireland now, then you'll find that the street signs are usually in both languages, right? You'll have, you know, but there are virtually no people who only speak Irish and who don't speak English at all. In certain parts of the country, there might be people, who, particularly certain rural areas, there might be people who pretend they don't speak English, but there are not very many of them, right? That's mostly in the, the, the far west. But in 
1899, W.B. Yeats was one of the co-founders with Lady Gregory and Edward Martin of the Irish Literary Theater. And the goal of this particular group was to stage original Irish plays primarily written in English to Irish audiences, right? Like the tip, your typical Irish theater in the 1890s um, would host touring companies from England or from continental Europe um, who would, you know, put on whatever the popular plays of the day were. These theaters didn't have like their own house company that put on original plays. So the Irish Literary Theater, which later in the 20th century evolves into what's now the Abbey Theater, the State Theater of Ireland, um, tries to develop a distinctive Irish literary tradition with its own distinctive style of acting as well, and its own stable company of actors. So this Irish Literary Theater is also going to be part of a bigger wave that we now refer to as the Irish Literary Revival. And I promise we're actually like going to um, get to some of these poems in a moment and like somebody other than me will get to say things. <laughs> but there's a lot of background material here that I think everybody needs before we can really dig into this stuff. So this Irish literary revival begins in the 1880s and kind of comes in two waves. We'll talk about the second wave next time. But for today, it's important for us to understand what this early wave looked like. So, the first element that we tend to see in works of this movement are references to Irish folklore and mythology. So you may have noticed a lot of this kind of thing in the Yeats poems that you read for today. There is also a lot of celebration of the Irish landscape. So you'll get a lot of references to um, specific Irish locations, place names, things of that nature. Um, and you will also typically see glorification of the rural west. So the West, right, that is, you know, that old kingdom of Connaught there, right, uh, being predominantly rural and predominantly Irish speaking was regarded by a lot of these revivalists as the true Ireland, right? That this was the real heart of the country. Um, this was where Irishness could actually be kind of physically located. So the further west you went in Ireland, according to this line of thinking, the more Irish things got. So even though practically all of the writers involved with this movement are educated, often Anglo-Irish Dubliners, there's this romanticization of the rural western landscape um, that um, permeates their work. 
And the other thing they tend to celebrate is peasant culture, or at least a version of it. So one of the things I put on your bibliography is an article by a guy by the name of Edward Hirsch called The Imaginary Irish Peasant. And I want to preface this by saying that other critics have contested Hirsch's arguments here, right? But one of the things that Hirsch argues is that these essentially middle class writers find it really useful to create this kind of ideal rural, like, you know, rural peasants in their work as um, something to project their ideas of Irishness on, right? So you will often see a kind of uncritical celebration of rural life and peasant culture in early works of the Irish literary revival. Now, somebody like W.B. Yeats, so Yeats is well, Yeats lives most of his life in Dublin, but also spends a good bit of time in London. And as a child, spent a lot of time in Sligo in the West. Um, but he's a middle class kid who probably wouldn't know a real peasant if one walked up and bit him on the ass. <laughs> Nonetheless, He's fascinated by, you know, peasant folk tales and folklore and stories about the sixth sense and fairies and the evil eye and Irish mythology and like kind of like all of this kind of native supernatural material, right? In fact, this is one of the vaguely embarrassing things about Yeats for a lot of Yeats scholars. Um, so in the late 19th century, a lot of people experimented with alternative, with alternative religions, right? You know, particularly like alternatives to conventional Christianity. Yeats's particular expression of this uh, was to think he was a wizard. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so he belonged to a group that was kind of modeled on Freemasonry, but like Freemasonry plus wizard shit. <laughs> um, called the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. And, you know, they wore a lab, they would, you know, gather um, at their chapter house in London, and they would wear elaborate robes and give each other Latin nicknames and perform ceremonial magic towards what end, I don't really know. <laughs> they, they thought, you know, they thought it was working, right? But, you know, but it, it was like part of a kind of genuine seeking for spirituality in a world that I think for a lot of people, particularly a lot of middle class educated professionals, seemed void of it, right? But yeah, so yes, Yeats, Yeats thought he was a wizard. So that's kind of the Anywho, moving <laughs> right along here. Um, let's actually try to dig into some of these poems. And um, we may end up talking about other influences on these, but I'm most interested in trying to um, connect this to this specifically Irish history and Irish folklore. So what did you think of these poems? I mean, I thought it was interesting how he's speaking in English, but he definitely has that like Irishy tone. Like in the beginning when he's saying, <laughs> where dips the Rocky Highland? Like that's a, uh -huh. like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I think there are, there are some scholars who argue that Yeats and a lot of other Irish writers of the period um, try to adopt something like an Irish, so word order is different in the Irish language than it is in um, uh, 
um, in English, right? So, like for example, um, if you know where you would say in English, I am going to the store. The Irish equivalent of that phrase would uh, translate directly: "It is to the store that I am going." Right? Just because, like, like the the way the verb forms work, and you know, the way sentence structure works is different. And yeah, there are some there are some critics who argue that Yeats and other writers try to imitate um, those Irish language uh, sentence structures. I don't think that's what's going on with Yeats because Yeats didn't speak Irish. So Yeats is Anglo-Irish. So he is an Irish person of English descent. But he is an Anglo-Irish person who is completely fascinated by Irish history and folklore and is certainly active, at least early in his life, in anti-colonial causes. So he's on the side of the Irish against the English, to the extent that that's possible. Any other observations you'll have about these poems? I definitely can tell, before you can um, set it with the first wave, about that Irish landscape, landscape and uh -huh. um, loving or romanticizing the Irish landscape mm -hmm. was in the, the Man Who Dreamed Fairyland. Yeah. He mentions, he mentions multiple places in Silgo or Sligo? Sligo. 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 Sligo, yes. Sligo is in kind of like, so if you recall the map I drew, the very crappy map I drew on the board, right? So Sligo would be in kind of like that northish, westish corner of Connacht. So yes, yeah, Sligo is in the west on the coast. I have been to Sligo. I have uh, seen Yeats's, Yeats's grave in Sligo. The weird thing about Yeats's grave is, uh, guess where Mrs. Yeats is buried? Nowhere near? <laughs> At his feet. <laughs> oh. Yeah, that's a little strange, yeah? <laughs> okay. Is it yeah. just like a really graveyard, or do you think that well, was intentional? It's, 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 it's pretty small. Like, I, 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 have to, I, I don't know. It's, just a, it's a strange observation. <laughs> <laughs> like, huh, oh, that's weird. <laughs> but yeah, no, but then, yeah he, he, he makes particular use of places he remembers from his childhood in Sligo. So yeah, like in The Man Who Dreamed of Fairyland, all of these villages are in Sligo. Um, Glen Carr, the waterfall he mentions in um, The Stolen Child is in Sligo. Um, and uh, <clears throat> the other thing, let's see, um, Inishbury, the island that he mentions, is in the middle of a lake in Sligo. So particularly early in his career, he is very much like fascinated with this landscape of his childhood. Well, if you want to say some of the tones of the poem, they seem like um, when he's writing this, you said this, this was kind of around the time when the idea of the child was being discussed. And so I can kind mm -hmm. of tell that fairy tale and like childlike um, thing within some of the poems. Yeah, in particular, The Stolen Child, right? Although I think there is also, like, there's a hint of malice and threat in that poem as well. I don't think that the vision that the fairies are selling to the child is an innocent one, right? It's an attractive one. But I think yeah, that there, there, there's, there's still something ominous in it as well. So why don't we actually go there for a minute? Let's, let's kind of go through this poem a little bit, because I think this is actually a fairly typical early Yeats poem that'll tell us a lot about the kinds of things he's concerned with. Um, so can I get somebody to read that first, um, that first stanza to us? I can. Thank you. Where dips the rocky highland of slip wood in the lake, there lies a leafy island where flapping herons wake. 
the drowsy water rats. There, there we hid our fairy bats, full of berries and of reddish stolen cherries. Come away, O human child, to the waters in the wild, with a fairy hand in hand, for the world's more full of weeping than you can understand. Okay, thank you. So, where do we want to start with this? <laughs> What do you all notice in the stanza? Let's think about this again from the perspective of a child, right? I mean, in some ways, like, it could see it could seem like here's like a place where you could kind of explore like there's a highland and a lake and this mm -hmm. island and then they're like oh and look we have like these tasty looking fruits and like uh -huh. all these sorts of things which like the berries would also be like pretty colorful so like yeah. that generally attracts people too but i think it's mm -hmm. interesting with the how throughout the poem like it repeats for the world's more full of weeping than you can understand uh -huh. and I'm wondering like since this kind of seems to be in that time frame with some of like the hunger and everything if maybe those berries was another thing like you might be weeping because you're hungry here but what we have is maybe this other food or something yeah somewhere okay, yeah no, I, I, yeah I, I think that's actually yeah like given like the relatively like you know people who had lived through the Great Famine would have been, uh, the, the Potato Famine would, would still be alive in 1886. So this is definitely like a very much a part of cultural memories. Yes, that attraction of food, right? And in particular, like, does this seem a little bit similar to the, the goblins come on in Goblin Market? Yeah, I mean, like, this isn't just, you know, for, like, this isn't, you know, potato soup or, you know, boiled cabbage, right? <laughs> <laughs> You know, this is, you know, look, you know, we've got, you know, bright red berries and stolen cherries, right? You know, we've, we've got, we've got tasty food. We've got these, you know, these dainty fruits that you can come and sample, right? But I, um, is there anything that hints at ominousness in this description of the fruits? Where do they get them? Stolen. Yeah, stolen cherries, right? And so, they've hid them, like they've hidden the vats of the berries. Yeah, they've got the yeah, this this hidden secret treasure, right? But I think what like there's also I think as you were talking about like the uh, the refrain here, right? The world's more full of weeping than you can understand. So they're also playing here on the child's limited experience, right? and the child's limited understanding of the world around, uh, around them. Now, <clears throat> can I get somebody to read the next stanza for us? Yes, I can. Go for it. Okay. Where the wave of moonlight glosses, the dim gray sand of light, far off by fur furthest rosses, we put it all the night. Weaving all the dances, moving hands and wrinkling glances, till the moon has taken flight, to and fro we lead, and chase our faulty bubbles, while the world is full of troubles, and is anxious in its sleep. Come away, O human child, to the waters and the wild, with a fairy hand in hand, for the world is more full of weeping than you can understand. Thank you. So, let's take a minute here and think about, like, what kinds of activities we see the fairies engaging in here. What do they do and when do they do it? Well, I mean, it talks about like them dancing uh -huh. and at night. Yeah, they dance at night. In fact, is there anything they seem not to do at night? <laughs> so yes, yeah, so they're yeah they're associated with night, right? Hmm. They dance. They leap. So what else can we say they're associated with? Like that, um, like not so good thought that they were talking about the golf market, like that everything <laughs> bad happens at night. Like, <laughs> that's what, 
<laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, I, I think yeah, yeah, that's, yeah that, that, that there's like, yeah, um, in Goblin Market, we have that division between day and night, right, where the day is for, um, you know, industry and, you know, kneading cakes and milking cows and, you know, uh, you know, feeding the chickens and whatever, right? Um, and night is for sleep and dreams or for, you know, goblin nastiness, right? So I think, yeah, there is a similar division here. And the fairies occupy the nighttime, right? But what do we usually do at night? Sleep. We sleep, yeah. What do the fairies not do? Clearly not do. Sleep. Yeah, apparently ever, right? They're in constant motion, right? Their whole world here is about furious movements. Dancing, leaping, chasing, right? They're always in motion. While the world is full of troubles and is anxious in its sleep. There you go, dancing the right way. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So sleep here isn't associated with rest, right? Sleep is associated with anxiety, with, with nightmares, with bad dreams, right? But then let's think about where the bad dreams might come from. Where the wandering water gushes from the hills above Glencar to pools above the rushes that scarce could bathe a star, we seek for slumbering trout and whisper in their ears, giving them unquiet dreams. Leaning softly out from ferns that drop their tears over the young streams, and then the same refrain, right? So, what might, what might be making the world anxious here? Or who might be making the world anxious here? <laughs> Trout, right? <laughs> Which I mean, do do trout even dream? Who knows, right? I, I certainly know my dog does because, like, you know, she'll be curled up on her bed and start kicking, and you know, like it's this weird, like, like she's barking, but it's like this weird muffled bark. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so, so some animals we know do dream, but yeah, the fairies are the source of unquiet dreams for these slumbering trout, right? And. Is there something about that that maybe seems kind of mean? <laughs> like this is, you know, not just innocent fun here. This is actually kind of a dick move. And yeah, like if they can give bad dreams to trout, right? Why couldn't they give bad dreams to people? Now, can I get somebody to read for us the the last stanza, which is actually different, right? So. All of these four stanzas have been addressed to the child, right? Mm -hmm. Kaylee, can you read number four for us? For right. sure. Um, it says, Away with us he's going, the solemn-eyed. He'll hear no more the lowing of the calves on the warm hillside, or the kettle on the hob sing peace into his breast, or see the brown mice bob round and round the oatmeal chest. For he comes, the human child, to the waters and the wild, with a fairy hand in hand, from a world more full of weeping than he can understand. So how is this stanza different from the others first? It's more like from the fairy's perspective. It's like, <laughs> away with us, he's going, and yeah. not like trying to just speak to the child necessarily. Yeah, who are they talking to now? They're not talking to the child anymore. Like now they're talking to the audience. Yeah, or even like among themselves, right? This is more more like overheard speech, right? And so, do they need to convince the kid anymore that it's it's good to come with them? But at this point, they've convinced him. They've already convinced him. Yeah, he's on his way. So they're a little more honest in this stanza, right? about what the kid is leaving behind. And when we look at this, like, 
does the, does the world the child is leaving behind actually sound that bad? He'll hear no more the lowing of the calves on the warm hillside, or the kettle on the hob sing peace into his breast, right? So, you know, the lowing of calves, you know, the, the whistling of the kettle, like, what are the, what state are these sounds being related to? If the kettle sings peace into his breast. The idea is to evoke um, Ireland specifically, right? Mm -hmm. um, this is a rural Irish landscape. Although, yeah, you'll still hear calves lowing and tea kettles um, whistling in, you know, either country, right? In fact, um, the Irish are actually the world's largest per capita consumers of tea, and the Finns are the world's largest per capita consumers of coffee. So, take that fact home with you as well. <laughs> How much I mean, coffee do they have to drink? Because Americans drink a lot of coffee. Well, you know, in, 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 in most parts of the U.S., apart for, except for, you know, the very northern parts of Alaska, it's not dark for six months out of the year. So <laughs> 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 they probably need a little extra juice, right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, let's, so the lowing of calves, the whistling of the kettle, singing peace into his breast, right? Maybe it's more like home. Yeah, kind of like a homey, relaxing kind of sensation, right? And the fairies we see are definitely not associated with relaxation, right? If anything, they're associated with agitation. So what the child is leaving behind here, and leaving behind these home comforts, right? He's leaving behind, you know, peace and rest for a world of constant furious motion. So, <clears throat> I think part of what's being described here, I think that in a lot of ways, this is a kind of metaphor for the life of the poet, that you sacrifice everyday, mundane, comfortable reality for a world of visions that's in constant motion, but that doesn't give you any peace. And I think that there's a similar thing going on in The Man Who Dreamed of Fairyland, right? I think that, like, the, the at least in these early poems, Yeats associates fairies and their realm and their activities with imagination, with creativity. And if we look at the man who dreamed of fairyland, right, this is, you know, in a lot of ways, it's a poem about a guy whose imagination won't leave him alone. Right, no matter where he goes, no matter what, what he's doing, he sees these visions that disturb his peace, right? So if we go to page 216 here, right, he stood among a crowd at Drumahair, his heart hung all upon a silken dress, and he had known at last some tenderness before earth took him to her stony care. But when a man poured fish into a pile, it seemed they raised their little silver heads and sang what gold or evening sheds upon a woven world-forgotten isle where people love beside the rattled seas that time can never mar a lover's vows under that woven changeless roof of boughs. The singing shook him out of his new ease. So if we try to pick this apart here, what's, what's, what's going on in this stanza? What state do we find the man who's the subject of the poem in at the beginning of the stanza? 
he kind of seems like he's dead because it says before <laughs> Earth took him to her stony care. But okay, he yeah. definitely doesn't seem like he's dead at the end. So. Yeah, it, it, yeah it, the, the poem is describing someone who is now dead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll get to the end of the poem in a minute. Yeah. But, uh, well, in the first, it seems like you know, he's in a crowd of people, but maybe is he, he's like fishing? He's not actually fishing. Like, let, let's look, look, if we look at these, for like, his heart hung all upon a silken dress, and he had known at last some tenderness. Is he in love with someone? Is this about a romantic interest? Yes, this, the, yeah, it's about a romantic interest, and one that apparently probably gets in some way satisfied, right? prior to his vision of the little fishes singing their song, right? And the singing shook him out of his new ease that whatever this tenderness is had brought him, right? So, you know, he's, he, he, he's you know, walking through the village square, he's feeling pretty good about himself, and then suddenly this little pile of fishes starts singing to him, right? <laughs> So yeah, one, one one could see where that might be disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> but let's kind of skip down here to the last stanza, in which right we you know it's the the description is of you know a man who is clearly dead, right? So can I get somebody to read that for us? He slept under the hill of Lubnagal. Go for it. He slept under the hill of the gall, and by the hill that lies unhung its sleep, under that cold and vapor turbid steep, now that the earth had taken man and all. Did not the worm despite about his bones proclaim but that unwearied reed crying, that God has laid his has laid his fingers on the sky, that from those fingers glittering summer runs upon the dance of our June sway. Why should those lovers that why should those lovers that no lovers miss dream until God burn nature with a kiss? The man has found no comfort in the grave. Thank you. So, sit with this for a minute and see what you can make out of it. particular if you can connect it back in some way to what's going on in the stolen child. Well, I mean, it brings back up like that whole like the dancing and kind of that dreamless wave. So I'm wondering like maybe it was the one that he like fell in love with was like a fairy that he imagined or something. <laughs> well, I, I, I think that there's definitely something like to do with restless imagination here, right? I mean, the go ahead. Anxiousness, the anxiousness and the sleep. How yeah. Um, most people are, are in, in the world full of troubles and mm -hmm. anxious in their sleep. Uh -huh. uh, the fairies and all the up and dancing. Right. And they said that now that he's dead, he can finally get some unhaunted sleep. So <laughs> yeah. yeah. sleep. That's right. No more little fishy singing to him. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh huh. Um, I mean, but then at the end, he said the man has found no comfort in his grave. So. Right. Because what what ha what what's happening to him even here in the grave? The little fishies aren't singing to him. The worms are eating him. But the worms <laughs> that are going about his bones are singing to him, right? Yeah. So, right. Yeah, like, like even in death, he finds no peace. And I think that again, like, you know, the 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 main point of contact between these two poems is that they are about the you know the peculiar form of agitation caused by poetic creativity or poetic vision, right? 
which I think probably also connects them back to Romanticism in, you know, in, in a way, because, you know, Romanticism, whatever, you know, Romantic poetry, regardless of whatever else it seems to be about, is generally about thinking and about, you know, the human powers of imagination. Um, but here, like, the powers of imagination are a source of anxiety, right? It's almost like it's a burden rather than um, a gift. It's something that separates you from other people and from the nice and pleasant and comfortable things around you. And so I think that we're, we started a little early, so we're about at a time here. So I think that this is actually something that connects some of these poems to the character of Gabriel Conroy in The Dead, which we're reading for next time. So Joyce is about a generation younger than Yeats, um, and is also very much concerned with a lot of this Irish cultural baggage, but he's taking it in different directions. So I'm going to give you the guide questions for the dead, which, um, as far as I'm concerned, is the greatest and most beautiful short story written in the English language. So if you don't like it, I'll cry. <laughs> <laughs> Those of you who might have not seen uh, yet this week, I'll see you tomorrow.